as was just how I introduced, my name is Johanna Johnson, and I will be providing some context about the East Asian seas and then the Arafura and Timor seas within that, and about um, results we've had from the regional climate change vulnerability assessment and helping communities adapt to coastal climate change in the region. So, uh, as I said, I'll provide a broader uh, context for the East Asian seas, then uh, focus down to the Arafura and Timor Seas region and the vulnerability of marine and coastal systems. And then talk a little bit about a draft decision-making guide that's been developed to help local decision-making, which is such an important part of new science to inform management. And finally, uh, provide a bit of an introduction to some case studies that are ongoing testing this guide for decision makers, one in Indonesia and one in Timor Leste. And then you will hear from our colleagues about the specifically the case study in Oaseli in Rotendau, Indonesia. So the East Asian Seas region, as many of you are familiar with, very large region that encompasses multiple countries and the coasts and marine environments of those countries. It's an area of very high uh, tropical biodiversity. Uh, it's actually uh, encompasses the Coral Triangle uh, area, which is the area of highest tropical biodiversity in the world uh, for marine and terrestrial species. So very important from an ecological perspective. However, there are a lot of changes happening in the region and um, for coastal and marine systems are, are really under pressure from these changes. And they're things like changes in demography. So population increase, a movement to urban centres and coastal areas, uh, which are putting greater pressure, coastal resources and increasing the demand for coastal resources. Also social and economic development that again, you know, um, is increasing the demand for resources and also climate change. And all of these drivers are actually impacting specifically on coastal and marine resources and sorts of impacts are coming from things like land-based pollution, particularly again as populations increase, people move to the coast, there's greater pollution associated with uh, urban centres as well as agriculture. Uh, marine debris coming from again both, both waste as well as from things like discarded fishing gear. Uh, destructive fishing practices, uh, overfishing uh, and illegal fishing, poaching and shipping incidents, particularly groundings and oil spills. So all of these pressures have been identified and are occurring in the region and are also increasing as we get these sort of social, uh, demographic, economic and climate change uh, that is continuing in the future. In terms of climate change for the East Asian seas, uh, there has already been observed warming, uh, and this is both air and sea temperatures, and importantly, more extremes, is increasing extremes. So things like more heat waves uh, or more marine heat waves as well have already been seen. Uh, there's really uncertain rainfall changes, so we're seeing both wetter and drier conditions, but what is noticeable already, again, are these extremes. So while some places might be wet or drier, there's certainly been more extremes in terms of these heavy rainfall events or these longer dry periods or droughts. Uh, sea level rise, as we already heard, um, has started, is being observed and is uh, projected to continue into the future. And all of these changes are driving other changes. For example, increasing sea surface temperatures being noted to cause uh, coral bleaching. So heat stress, can stress coral reefs and they bleach and can ultimately die and that has impacts for the species that depend on those habitats as well as the industries that depend on those habitats. Uh, expansion of species ranges as certain areas become warmer, uh, species moving and declining productivity particularly of important fisheries. Uh, already as well the oceans in the region have started to become more acidic they're absorbing uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere that is changing the chemistry, of the pH of the oceans. And as they become more acidic, again, this is impacting the species and the habitats that, that are in the oceans, in coastal environments, and uh, to a point where it is projected they will not be able to, to thrive or grow as well as they do now. And obviously these extreme events that I mentioned have already been observed, things like heat waves, droughts, more extreme storms, more severe storms and floods, and these are projected to continue. 
So while we have this backdrop of change that is happening in the region, we also have this ongoing uh, climate pressure that is accelerating. Now, if we put that into context in terms of the people and the industries that are really important in the region, uh, in East Asia, for example, we have 30,000 or over 30,000 fisheries jobs. Now, that actually represents 79% of all fisheries jobs in the world. So really significant portion of people get an income from fisheries. It also is the largest aquaculture producer, which is critical for both food security and for uh, income and livelihoods. Taking that down to Indonesia, as an example, uh, marine fishery production has increased a lot over the last 20 years from about 4 million tonnes of fish caught each year in 2000 to 6.7 million tonnes in 2018. And that actually represents 8% of the global fish caught from the oceans. Indonesia is also the second largest producer of farm seaweed in the world, producing 11 million tonnes in 2008 and has the second largest fleet of fishing vessels over 24 metres. So uh, the resources of coastal and marine ecosystems are critically important for industries and communities in the region. Now, if we look more specifically to the Arafura and Timor Seas uh, part of East Asia, uh, we know that fish provide more than 50% of the animal protein that people depend on. And the region also supports, again, this really high diversity, particularly of migratory, rare and threatened species, things like marine turtles, whales, dolphins, sharks and rays. So from both a social and an ecological perspective, the region is really important. Um, so now looking more at just at the Arafura and Timor Sea regions and the coastal ecosystems in the region, it actually lies, and you can see there the map, again, of the Arafura and Timor Sea region that the ATSI program is focusing in. And you can see that it lies at the um, congruence of two large marine ecosystems, the Northern Australian Shelf and the Indonesian Sea, LME. So these are important ecological large marine ecosystems and the Arafura and Timor Sea region has both of them within its boundaries. It is a highly biodiverse habitat, uh, has a highly biodiverse habitat, of corals, mangroves, seagrass and open ocean. There are many species of conservation interest, uh, things that are migratory rare and threatened. And they also support critically important fisheries, tourism and aquaculture, again, important for income and food. So obviously uh, it's just a, a smaller area of what I've been talking about earlier. Uh, the majority of the population lives on the coast, uh, often in high density, and there are a number of threats from things like coastal pollution and development, overfishing, illegal and unreported fishing, shipping, oil and gas mining and marine debris. So that's the context for the region and climate change is that additional layer on top of all of those pressures. It's also got really complex uh, ocean climate processes. So you can see in that map there that there's really complex currents tidal flows and we saw that earlier in the video it actually has the Indonesia flu which is a warm water current that connects the Pacific Ocean with the Indian Ocean so two very large oceans and that connection and those currents actually drives the climate not just in the region but more broadly so it actually has a role in driving global uh, climate and all of those currents that you see that go between the islands actually are very complex and have a very important role. Uh, they're very low profile coasts, so low lying atolls and, and islands, uh, a very shallow continental shelf, so not very many deviations, and complex sort of tidal processes. So you get very fast currents that run through the region and very high energy tides, which obviously has an influence on habitats and species that live in the region, uh, how they are exposed to changing climate and obviously the communities that depend on them. It's also a generally low saline environment because it is shallow and also because there's uh, quite high rainfall, particularly in the monsoon season. So a very complex system, but very important from a climate perspective. So all of the resources within the ATS region, they have, it is a biodiversity hotspot. Uh, it has a role in regulating global climate. 
Uh, obviously support very important high value fisheries and employment associated with those fisheries. Uh, it provides primary sources of protein for millions of people. The coastal resources also support other industries and sectors like tourism, shipping, oil and gas exploration. And there's also an important role of coastal resources in providing protection for uh, villages and cities along these low-lying coasts. So a really important resource and one that is already under pressure as ATSI-1 identified so clearly. To give you a sense of how it is a biodiversity hotspot, uh, there has been many species of coral, reef fish, mangroves and seagrass identified. The ATS region in fact has 25% of the world's mangroves in area. So that's quite a large area of the world's mangroves for a region that is relatively not that large. There are also many species of rare and threatened turtles, dugongs, sharks and rays, um, whales, dolphins, many migratory species of whales and dolphins as well. And then nesting species that visit during uh, breeding seasons, things like shorebirds, seabirds, and again, turtles. So really important biodiversity, which obviously supports the ecosystem function and then the communities and societies that depend on the region, the region's um, coastal resources. So climate change uh, was identified as a primary environmental concern in ATSI, the first phase of ATSI. And as I've said, the impacts in the broader region as well as in the Arafura and Timor Sea region have already been observed. And what this does is it actually adds to the existing pressures and threats on these coastal resources. So the vulnerability assessment was set up to try and understand what species and habitats are most vulnerable to climate change and what is driving that vulnerability so that adaptation options could be identified to minimise vulnerability and really have um, those resources be maintained into the future. So to give you a sense about how all of this interacts and this cascade of effects, what we have is a, an ocean and coastal system that really supports uh, the whole of the region in terms of habitats and species. And if that changes, it actually influences the habitats and species. So as climate change affects the oceans and the coasts, habitats and species are impacted, um, as are things like the fisheries, both oceanic and coastal, that are derived from those species, and the aquaculture that um, is farmed along the coast. And then there's a cascade of effects down to things like economic development, revenue, food security and livelihoods. So it's really important to understand the vulnerability of the habitats and species that so many sectors people depend on to climate change so that you can uh, minimise or have adaptations that help minimise that vulnerability and hopefully can maintain uh, the goods and services that those resources provide to people. So the vulnerability assessment uh, focused on the Arafura and Timor Seas region, but it would divide it into five sub-regions. And that was done because most of the adaptations that were likely to be implemented were going to be on a jurisdictional level. They will be different as different countries have different legislations and regulations. So the five sub-regions represent uh, different jurisdictions. They also represent, you know, the general movement of species and, and a manageable um, area in terms of the sorts of fisheries that are targeted. So we had five sub-regions that were assessed. We used a, a fairly well-known and standard framework of vulnerability that comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, whereby you get a measure of exposure and sensitivity to understand what the potential impacts might be on species or habitats, then factor in the adaptive capacity to then get an ultimate measure of vulnerability and the vulnerability is relative. So it gives you a sense of the most vulnerable species or habitat down to the least vulnerable species or habitat in that particular sub-region. And ultimately, by being able to look at what is driving that vulnerability, what is the source for each species and each habitat, you can identify some adaptation options that might minimise that vulnerability. So exposure for the analysis was based on two future climate change projections for the region. That is a medium emission scenario of RCP 4.5 and a high emission scenario of RCP 8.5 out to 2070. So about 50 years in the future. 
RTP 8.5, the high emission scenario is essentially where the world is tracking at the moment and is what we call business as usual. Whereas the medium emission scenario is uh, when hopefully the global community can reduce emissions and uh, reduce the scale or the magnitude of climate change into the future. Then the sensitivity uh, indicators that we used came from a range of sources, uh, basically published data about what we know about how species or habitats respond or react to climate and changes in their environment. So this is the ecological data, as well as expert elicitation. So using local knowledge in each of the countries and what they know about not just how species respond, but um, essentially people and industries and the likely uh, options for change or adaptive options for change within those uh, sectors and communities. So a range of data was used and then we did the analysis using that formula you see on the screen to get a relative vulnerability for the species and the habitats that we assessed. So the species that were assessed were species of conservation interest and these were all identified again by the different countries and uh, specialists and experts in those countries so that they're relevant to current industries, current community needs and current management actions. Um, so species of conservation interest, uh, fishery species that already have a high annual catch by weight or value, therefore important for both food security and livelihoods, um, as well as species that are identified for possible future exploitation. So might not have a current high catch, but maybe in the future develop further. And this included, the species in the end included a range of biota, so fin fish, as well as crustaceans, whales, dolphins, sharks, rays, sea cucumbers, a whole suite of different types of species. We also assessed five habitats uh, based on their role to support the species that are in the region and also provide coastal protection and support ecosystem structure and function. So they were coral reefs, coastal coral reefs, seagrass meadows, mangroves, deep reefs, so those that are over 40 metres in depth, as well as open ocean. And you can see in the map on the right there that the mangroves are in green, the coral reefs are in dark pink, and the seagrass areas are in light pink. So uh, lots of coastal habitats that are accessed on a regular basis by communities and that support, provide critical habitat for many species. In Indonesia and Arafura sub-region, we assess 27 species, and here they are divided as species of conservation interest, uh, current fishery species that are targeted, and then other species, which include those that are either possibly going to be exploited further in the future or that have um, other values. In the Timor-Leste sub-region, we assess 24 species, again listed here. And in the PNG subregion, we assessed seven species. It was only the small part of Western Province that was included in the assessment because that's what's part of the Arafura Timor Seas region. And so it was again just those species that are currently important from a fisheries perspective or from a conservation perspective. And while we also assess species in the two Australian uh, subregions, so that northern part of Australia. Because the management recommendations and the adaptation recommendations are focusing on uh, Indonesia, PNG and Timor-Leste, and we are not providing recommendations for uh, Australian waters, I, I'm not going to show those listed here or specifically focus on those. But there was about 22 species uh, also assessed in Australian waters. So the first thing was to understand what the climate change projections are for 2070 under this medium and high emissions scenario uh, to the future. Now, this is a lot of data in front of you and you don't need to focus on the details just to show that we did this. We actually uh, spent quite a lot of time making sure the projections are relevant to each of the five subregions that were assessed and that in some cases we actually needed to do uh, downscale projections or modelling for the subregion. So we were very fortunate to partner with the Indonesian Met Services and they actually re-ran some of the climate projections for rainfall and air temperature um, for specifically this project and this assessment. Similarly, NOAA in the US re-ran some of the projections for ocean chemistry and sea surface temperature for this assessment. So in many cases, this is the latest projections uh, for this part of the world under the latest global climate models. 
in other cases, we needed to draw on more global projections and uh, where they were available. So for example, for storms and cyclones, um, their global projections out to 2100. But this is the data that was used as the exposure part of the analysis. And just to summarize that for you, for the ATS region, basically there's going to be warmer sea temperatures, hotter air temperatures, more extreme rainfall, but that remember is both wetter and drier. So there's still quite a range of rainfall projections for the ATS region, uh, more acidic oceans, more intense storms. So while there might be fewer, the ones that do occur are expected to be more severe and sea level rise will continue. So that's the general uh, projections for the ATS region. And I'm just gonna show you though, that they actually are different depending on where you are located in the region. So they are spatially variable. And this is the uh, new projections that were done specifically for this at two vulnerability assessment by NOAA and the Indonesian Met Services. And you can see that it's not uniform across all areas of the region. On the left here, we have sea surface temperature and on the right, we have air temperature with the sort of the blues and the greens being less of a change and the uh, oranges and reds going through to uh, more of a change, so getting hotter. And you can see that obviously the northern parts of Australia are projected to become hotter much faster than say parts of the Arafura Sea. While for air temperature, uh, PNG and West Papua, particularly in the highlands, is going to get hotter faster than some of the islands and that inland areas will become hotter faster than coastal areas. So it really matters where you are, if, whether you're a species, a habitat or a person who relies on that species and habitat, it really matters where you are located as to what changes you will be exposed to. Similarly for uh, ocean chemistry on the left, and rainfall on the right, it really matters where you're located. With the Gulf of Carpentaria and obviously into uh, Western Province PNG, expected to experience the greatest declines in pH, so becoming more acidic in the ocean there, and that's the dark red, then parts again of the Arafura Sea, which is green and blue, and is going to experience less of this acidic waters or decline in pH. Uh, for rainfall, again, uh, some parts are likely to become uh, wetter and that's the dark brown areas and that's again in West Papua and parts of PNG, whereas quite a lot of the islands um, and, you know, you look at Timor-Leste today, they're, they're in the greens and blues. So not as much of a change, perhaps no change at all in total rainfall or a decline even, but it, when the rain falls is going to be critical. It's those extremes, the more flooding or more heavy rain and then the longer dry periods that is going to have an effect on the ecosystem and therefore the fisheries and the industries. So some of the results just summarized for habitats. Again, because climate is changing in different ways in different parts of the region, the, the habitats are also affected in different ways depending on where they're located. So the results are spatially variable. So shallow coral reefs are highly vulnerable to climate change, in particular increasing sea surface temperature, ocean acidification, uh, the current poor condition and other non-climate pressures like land-based po land pollution and lack of management. Whereas seagrass meadows are only moderately vulnerable to climate change, in particular, there are hotspot areas of vulnerability where sea surface temperature is increasing the most, changing rainfall patterns. There is low connectivity between seagrass meadows, therefore recovery will be slower, other non-climate pressures and lack of formal man management at the moment. For mangroves, the story is similar, moderately vulnerable to climate change, particularly around Timor-Leste and Western PNG, due to things like sea level rise, rainfall declines. So it's those locations, again, where there are projected to be rainfall declines, poor current conditions, low species diversity, low connectivity, which can affect recovery and lack of current formal management. Deep reefs are less studied, but we do know that they are vulnerable to things like increased temperature, ocean acidification, and changing temperature at depth that will also affect oxygen levels in deeper waters and affect circulation. So to show you again how that varies by location, if we look at the results for coral reef vulnerability on a map, we can see that the areas that are yellow have lower relative vulnerability or low relative vulnerability than the areas in red and dark red that have high 
relative vulnerability. And clearly there's some real hot spots of vulnerability around Timor-Leste and in the Indonesia Arafura subregions, particularly around Rotendau and also um, Manatutu, as well as Chul in the Arafura Sea. So these are the areas, the dark red, that are the highest vulnerable coral reefs to climate change. And we know why, because we've been able to look back through the analysis and really specifically identify why each of those areas is dark red and highly vulnerable. So for us, again, if we look at it on a map and how it varies by location, you can see again going from blue relative low vulnerability to dark red relative high vulnerability that again, there are some hot spots of vulnerability in the Gulf of Carpentaria. And that's driven by that uh, sort of really high changing um, ocean acidification and temperature there. And also in parts of the Indonesia Arafura Sea area and Northern Timor-Leste. So this really gives a good sense of where uh, you have your highly vulnerable habitats, which will obviously influence species as well, and where perhaps communities might to see the greatest changes sooner. So where local actions uh, will be needed. If we look at the species result on a general level, and obviously all of this is published in a lengthy report, and people are welcome to go look at that for more details. But again, the results are spatially variable. The species, depending on where they live, where they breed, where they feed, uh, where they, whether they are, have a wide range or a small range, uh, are differently affected or vulnerable to climate change. So we ranked all of the species for the five subregions from the highest to lowest vulnerability. We identified the drivers of their vulnerability for each species in each region. And we also identified a series of adaptation recommendations to minimise specifically those drivers of vulnerability and target management to where it's needed the most. And so to give you a snapshot, as I said, the more detailed information is available in the report. These are the five most vulnerable species in each of the five subregions. Now you can see they're different in different subregions, and that's because there's different exposure to, to climate change. There's different management in each region, different exploitation rates, for example, for fisheries. So that really matters when you're assessing vulnerability and understanding that, and then being able to go back and target the things that are driving vulnerability. It's really key to making a difference and having successful adaptations. So for each of these, we have recommendations how you can minimise their vulnerability and promote their, their long-term sustainability. Ultimately for that, we realised that the regional results are at a bigger scale and can be very technical and complex. And in order to use that for local decision-making, we needed some sort of mechanism or tool to take it down to the sort of community level. So we've developed a draft guide for decision-makers, which is essentially a non-technical summary of all these regional results. And it has a series of tools or templates to help managers uh, or NGOs act as facilitators and work with communities to really use those regional results, but put them in a local context and really uh, help inform local assessments. So ultimately they can apply these at a local scale and help develop local actions that are relevant to their conditions and their circumstances and for the resources that are important for each community. So the guide aims to facilitate this targeted uh, and appropriate identification of adaptation actions that can be implemented at a community level. It has things like this where we have a range of different inputs. You know, the green are the regional inputs that come from the regional vulnerability assessment results, but then a whole lot of local knowledge is also inputted at the different steps. And that's the blue boxes here. So there's five steps in the guide starting right up at selecting local areas for the assessment down to moving to implementation. And in each step, there's a series of uh, tools to help communities work through that with the facilitator and have a series of outputs that ultimately lead to developing a community action plan with the goal that the community action plan is helping them minimise the vulnerability of their important natural resources to climate change, but links back to the regional results. So while it's a complex process, we're trying to simplify it in the guide and provide these tools uh, for facilitators to work with communities and ultimately end up with this action plan. The two case studies that we have in the um, ATSI region, uh, one in Timor-Leste, which is what we're calling a light touch case study, working with an existing project that's also under the ATSI 2 program to support 
are the ecosystem based approach to fisheries management and inputting the regional results and the guide to that process. And then a more in depth uh, case study in Rottendale in Oaseli village that is using the guide from start to finish, testing it, improving it, and ultimately, uh, you know, we'll have a final guide that could be applied to other locations or communities. And the Oaseli village is, uh, like I said, something that you'll hear about more uh, from the next speaker. So the potential output we're hoping from these case studies is essentially, you know, really testing this ability to have a local style assessment of community dependence on their vulnerable fisheries, but understanding regionally why these fisheries are vulnerable, or these habitats and species are vulnerable. Developing a local action plan that really targets actions to minimise vulnerability so that we can support long-term food security and livelihoods. Uh, incorporating local findings into the national and regional initiatives. And ultimately we'll write all of this up, have some lessons learned and finalise the guide so that it can be used by other local communities. So the OSDELI case study is uh, in progress. I think it's been really successful so far and you will be hearing from Iqbal and Riz about how that's been going and some of the findings. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you so much to Hannah for your informative presentation. Uh, you reminded us that in-depth assessment unable us to get a clear picture of the current status of climate change and vulnerability in the region, as well as what kind of action to be taken. Thank you very much. So as the next speaker, um, I would like to invite Mr. Iqbal Alexander, uh, the founder and the director of um, Cartabri Bumi Recycling Center. Um, he will be sharing the application of the climate change adaptation program that Johanna has introduced into the local practice. So um, Iqbal, you have the floor. Thank you, Nagisa, and thank you, Johanna, for introducing me. Um, can anyone share my uh, slide? Okay, so the, implement the implementation was conducted from 25th of September to 11th of October for more than uh, two weeks. Doing a field trip during pandemic has its own challenge but we applied COVID-19 protocols throughout the trip. We gathered people in open space and not more than 20 people. And we tested the guide for uh, decision maker using the regional climate change vulnerable assessment in Rotendao to explore both the relevancy and the effectiveness. Uh, the case study took place uh, in fishing village called OSLE. Next slide, please. Uh, and as you can see from the map, OSL is the southernmost point in Indonesia. And in early 20s, the national government built military base. And that was also a turning point, not only for sovereignty, but also for the protection of vulnerable species and habitat. Next, please. Uh, we use several, several methodologies to carry out the case study. The first one is immersion. Uh, so seven field researchers were, were immersed in OSLE fillets for four days and night to build, report, informally chat, listen, and observe day-to-day observe the, the lives, what they eat, how they work and play, and how they perceive environment. We engaged it with more than uh, 80 community members, including women, youth, village of, uh, official, with them briefing in the end of each day to discuss uh, emerging findings. Next, please. Uh, the village is about an hour from the district capital in Ba'a. OSLE village has around 2,800 residents and around four. 480 household. Uh, this, this picture is the weekly market every Wednesday morning that sell most of household uh, necessities from food to clothes. Next please. Uh, the village is divided into five sub-villages. One village is located on the coast, 
and four villages are located upland. And Christian is, is the main religion with a minority Muslim who live in uh, who live on the coast and Catholic. Uh, the village has a reasonable with electricity, phone signal. However, the supply of fresh water is uh, limited. Next, please. Uh, most of people make income as fishers, seaweed farmers, and crop farmers like raspberry, palm sugar, and vegetables. And a, a mother said to us once, uh, ocean is our supermarket. We get our food from the ocean. So these three pictures explaining uh, that most of, a lot of women uh, went to the ocean to glean for uh, mussel and crab. Uh, they use like a giant fork to, to look for uh, mussel and uh, crabs. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> there is a distinctive occupation between men and uh, women. Kitchen and farming usually are mom's role, and fishing and palm sugar are usually uh, dad's role. Uh, women typically have uh, multiple roles as a busy routine with domestic activities, seaweed farming, crop farming, uh, caring for young children and elderly. Uh, they wake they wake up from five in the morning and take a break uh, during the day. And at night, women like to spend time uh, relaxing, praying, and watching TV. While men who live on the coast mainly work as fisher, spending most of their time in the ocean. While men uh, who live upland work harvesting palm sugar. But we managed to ask them to describe how they spend their life from the from the time they uh, woke up until the, the time they go to bed. Next, please. While income is unpredictable, many families need at least uh, two hundred fifty thousand per week to buy rice, uh, a beetle nut, cigarettes, groceries, and daily money for children. Family also have increasing needs for gas, for smartphone credit, uh, and uh, motorbike gasoline, saving uh, to buy a new boat or livestock. And there is a constant need to, to contribute to the church and to uh, wedding and funeral expenses. Many families take loan from fish buyer or seaweed buyer to make ends meet. Next, please. Uh, you prefer formal occupation like village official, military officer, police officer, teacher, because they provide steady income and social status. It will make our parents proud, but other work opportunities include uh, migrating for employment to Bali, Jakarta, and other city, and exploring emerging tourism opportunities in OSA village as tour guides, hospitality workers in restaurants, hotels, and uh, photographers. Next, please. But there are also some tension between, between people who live on the coast with uh, majority Muslim and Fisher, uh, with the people who live upland and working as a crop farmer. People who live in the coast, uh, they are new settlement with residents that have lived in the area for decades, coming from South uh, uh, Sulawesi, but all freshwater source are upland. So people who live in, in the coast is highly depending on the upland to get access to fresh water. Uh, but there were less observed tension around ethnicity and religious differences. As the head of the village described either you pray on Friday or, or uh, Sunday. So an inter-religious merit is common and uh, traditionally approved. Next, please. Um, so climate change has disrupted people's livelihood and uh, community. They have, they have noticed that the extreme weather has uh, in, has affected their crop a lot. And they noticed in April 20, 20, uh, 2021, there's a big um, uh, storm, Seroja, that not only destroyed the corpse, but also destroyed the uh, coral reef. So they 
already noticed that uh, something is going on with, uh, with the weather and they need to do something about it, but they're not really sure how they could improve the quality of the environment. Next, please. Um, fish is a low pollute uh, community. They rarely eat fish for festivities. People serve for uh, beef, lamb for birthday and wedding and, and funeral. And people not mention any fish that's significantly important for a cultural perspective. Next, please. And, and this is the uh, participatory mapping that we did with the fisher. They say we go further and further to catch fish. Uh, in the early 90s, they used to just fish around the shore, but now they need to go to the next island to look for fish. And even now, the fish in the next island also is, is, is decreasing, so they're worried about how, how they're going to look for food if in, the, in this area that uh, they don't provide food anymore. Next, please. And we also managed to do under underwater survey to observe the uh, coral reef and uh, marine species. Next, please. And the first picture is uh, one of the area that has healthy um, coral reef with a lot of fish. And the next picture is the uh, coral reef that are either bleached or also uh, destroyed by the use of, of uh, potassium. But around the OSLE village, there are, there are more there are more area that has uh, destroyed a coral reef than the healthy one. Next, please. And we also uh, managed to go fishing with the fishermen, and this is the typical harvest from the fishermen. Usually they, they manage to catch more than 20 fish each day. And uh, next, please. And <clears throat> we also did uh, participatory mapping just to identify the location of the fish and also the habitat. So uh, we know where's the um, contamination and also the uh, location of the uh, for our reef that's been uh, destroyed. Next, please. And from this map, we identified the location of habitat. The green dot is the location of uh, mangrove, and the blue dot is the location of seagrass, and the pink dot is the location of uh, coral reef. The pink dot with the stripe in the middle is the location where coral reef has been destroyed. Next, please. Um, reef has been destroyed. We were uh, the fish bombing since 80s, and potassium and locally fish poisoning are still uh, prevalent. People said that the reef needs uh, up to 20 years to be five, but uh, there is nothing uh, we can do anymore. Next, please. Uh, mangrove is left behind. They don't utilize mangroves. Some people use the branch as a firewood, but most of them, they just leave the mangrove there and they don't like to go to, uh, to the mangrove because they have many mosquitoes and snakes. Next, please. And this is the location of the uh, seagrass. We could find seagrass uh, uh, throughout the shoreline Locals only perceive seagrass as uh, providing fish and sell fish for food, but they don't use or uh, utilize uh, uh, seagrass at all, or they, cons or they don't conserve uh, seagrass at all. Next, please. And this is the mapping of uh, species. Uh, some of the species mentioned by the uh, community like plated fish, uh, sea turtle, shark, lobster, uh, red snapper are, are, are pretty much uh, located in the island. Next, please. And, and this is uh, one of the fishermen that we talked to. Uh, 
So Red Snapper is one of the high value uh, communities due to the demand from the uh, tourism sector. Next please. And this also a typical uh, fish that are identified in OSLE from uh, tuna, uh, yellowfin, uh, and then also uh, mackerel, red snapper, uh, rock pot, emperor, trout, uh, sweet leaf, and others. Next, please. And people said that you can eat all kind of fish locally expressed as kebas so they will eat any fish they found although women said that ikan uh, fish uh, mackerel are the cheapest and most viable fish to catch and to buy locally fisher uh, met on returning from fishing and caught red snapper rock caught and uh, also emperor mm, fisher share that black Collected fish and lobster and barangundi are getting rare, while brown and squid are seasonal. But mud crab is common, but fewer people are interested in eating and or buying it. Next, please. Um, everything costs twenty thousand. They value fishes from the size, uh, regardless the species uh, differences. Only lobster, red snapper, and deep fish are expensive, so people prefer to sell them outside the village. Uh, local fish only choose common fish to sell and avoid uh, any risk selling for high value uh, species. They also avoid uh, the risk of getting jailed and fined if they sell protected species like turtle and shark. Mm, next, please. Although people said that uh, they, do not, uh, they don't want to catch turtle and shark, but their motivation is more to avoid law enforcement rather caring about uh, conservation. Uh, as some officers said to us, to us that I saw a turtle this morning. I want to catch. I want to catch it, but I didn't want uh, to get jail. Uh, other officer added that if we find a uh, dead turtle, we will take it, but if it's alive, uh, we will release it. And this sentiment is cons consistently agreed by most villagers, despite current management and conservation effort, but the lack of compliance with laws and other pressure mean that marine habitat and species are not adequately uh, protected. Uh, next, please. And this is the seaweed. Uh, in the early uh, 2000, uh, most of women work as seaweed farmer, but the quantity and quality has decreased since the oil spills in 2009. So most of uh, women lost their income up to 80% alternative earnings, some of them working in construction and some of them uh, working in the farming industry. Uh, and they don't know how the uh, seaweed become infertile. Next, please. The second methodology we use is uh, FGD. We divided uh, the members into five groups, fisher, uh, all men and seaweed farmer, all women, and fish buyer, both men and women, fish official, both men, uh, both men and women, and youth, all, all men. Its group consisted uh, of eight to 12 participants uh, that are participated in two sessions. <clears throat> Next, please. So we, met, we made this welcoming poster to every group just to let them know that it will be fun and easy. And we also wrote the main activities of its FGD so they would know of what they're going to go through uh, every day. Next, please. The first FGD. We did uh, identification of habitat and species. We used a flash card to show them its of species and, and habitat. Uh, and among those uh, listed 26 um, species, only one uh, was ident uh, identified, which was uh, dugong. Next, please. And this is the list of the identified fish. 
um, the the black one is the one that uh, most common, and the green one is the protected, and the red one is the one that wasn't identified in the region. Next, please. The second activities uh, is to identify a local issue. So we give them post it and ask them to write any potential adaptation from the uh, a local issue that uh, previously uh, identified. Uh, uh, so we discuss the range of uh, potential adaptation. Next, please. Uh, we developed this form uh, for the first FGD to uh, determine the local issue on habitat and species, also to discuss the range of potential adaptation. Some of them were pre-filled, uh, the rest uh, like local name, local issue, and potential adaptation were discussed uh, within the group. This form also defined the importance of its habitat and species from four categories, cultural, subsistence, economic, and conservation. Next, please. But when we ask about the subsistence importance, uh, rather than ask them straightforward, but we kind of tweak the form by asking them, how does it taste like? Is it uh, taste good or taste bad or, or they've never, or they've never eaten it. And, and after they answered that question, we follow another question by asking how often they eat. Next, next slide, please. And for economic importance, we ask its uh, species and habitat, is it expensive or cheap? And then followed by how expensive or cheap it is to define the value of its habitat and species. Next, please. And the result is something like this. So we have uh, its habitat and species uh, valued and assessed by the local with the local name, the importance, local issue, and the range of uh, potential adaptation. Next, please. The second, uh, the second FGD, we, we, uh, narrow down the local issue into eight uh, local issue. Next, please. And uh, this is the eight um, main challenges identified by the group. The first one is Ikan Su Sedikit. The quantity of uh, uh, fisheries catch is uh, decreasing, especially for high value species such as black tip fish, lobster, and lab snapper. And then the second one, uh, Rubut Laut Noe, quantity and quality of seaweed is decreasing. Family that rely heavily on seaweed have to find alternative life food. The uh, number three is people uh, not associate value with mangrove and seagrass, despite uh, both, of, uh, both of the habitat providing critical ha uh, habitat for many fishery species. Uh, the next one is coral reef has been destroyed has been destroyed by uh, dynamic fishing and reducing uh, available habitats for target fishery species. The next one is the overuse of potassium and locally made fish poison by fisher. And turtle are being hunted and discreetly despite uh, protection of flow. And people will not report their uh, families for illegal activities such as dynamic fishing, fish poisoning to avoid a retaliation. And also they see there's an increasing interest and trend in ecotourism in Wotendao. Next, please. So uh, from those eight uh, main challenges, they come up with uh, local, uh, local action. And we filter those local action with two metrics. The first matrix is to assess the effectiveness and the uh, acceptance uh, by the uh, community. So they will just put uh, the local action uh, within the matrix, which one is the most uh, effective and which one is the least effective, and which one is socially accepted and not socially accepted. Next one. Next, please. And the second matrix, we assess the uh, local action by the uh, cost and also the capacity 
which one will uh, cost less and which one which one will cost uh, more and which one uh, that they could do it independently and which one they need uh, technical assistance and we did this uh, two metrics for five group and the result is below next please <clears throat> Uh, so the result is uh, like this. This is the potential adaptation coming from the fissure. Uh, as you can see in the uh, uh, right side, you can see the uh, green, the yellow, and the red. The, uh, uh, the green means that it's uh, low cost, uh, uh, low capacity, and then uh, the uh, 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 yellow one means that it's um, may be uh, low cost but uh, low capacity or high cost but high capacity and the red one is the one that low capacity uh, sorry high capacity but high cost and we did this with the five group uh, next please the next slide coming from the mother the five group next please And in the end of the day, we gather uh, the representative of its group to see uh, what other group come up with. Next, please. So we uh, hang all the results in, in our uh, hotel so people could see from its group what they have come up with and what, uh, what are their uh, local action. Next, please. And uh, and after that, we ask uh, if uh, a member of the group to, exp to explain more about their local issue, local adaptation, local action, and what they think would um, give more impact from their local action. Next please. And in the end of in the end of the activities, we ask its uh, a member of the group to vote which of the local action will give uh, impact for the whole community. Next please. And the result are these three uh, uh, priority for local action. The first one is to develop ecotourism in the village. The second one to make to make village low on fish poisoning fish poisoning ban and the third one is to make awareness video to protect the sea turtle next please and in the end of our food trip we also ask children because we haven't got any insight from the children so we gave children a piece of paper and asked them to uh, draw what they think about environment some of them uh, coming up with big stone uh, our roof it was flying. We gather in uh, the Patua homes to pray. Some of them say that we, we rarely see shark anymore. My dad looking for teeth face to Australia. And some of them saying that if we want to see shark, shall we go to Australia in the future? And this is the idea, idea from the uh, next generation about what they perceive uh, on environment. Next, please. Yes, that's it from me. Thank you. Thank you, Iqbal, um, for sharing this great practice where you involve the local decision maker and coastal community member in a very successful way. I was amazed by the fact that you extracted local knowledge in great detail and identify specific action areas, which are absolutely the key elements of community-based adaptation. Thank you very much. To move forward, let me invite Ms. Christine Ingrid Nassise, uh, who is a policy and research-based management specialist at SC2 Project. ATSI Project is a regional partnership program in Arafra and Tumosi regions, and Ingrid is coordinating the implementation of activities and setting up the monitoring system for the region's strategic action. So, Ingrid, you have the floor.
Thank you very much, Nagisa, and uh, good morning to all. I am honored to be able to share about uh, MC's work on ICM and how ICM can be used as a framework for addressing climate change adaptation at the local level. Do you see my screen? Sorry. Sorry, I'll be sharing my screen. Yeah. We we can okay. see the screen now. Thank you. So as we see as we have seen from the earlier presentations, coastal areas and communities are at the forefront of climate change impacts which amplify existing non-climate related threats and increase the overall vulnerability of natural and human systems in coastal areas. So climate change is such a cross-cutting issue that adaptation to its impacts must take place at all levels of government and the important role of the local government in this effort is well recognized. And with the wide ranging actions needed for climate change uh, adaptation, Good governance is a critical element of the response at all levels, with the recognition that institutions at all levels need to, need to build on what already exists and learn from experience while at the same time working towards more streamlined action. And Integrated Coastal Management, or ICM, has been one of the existing management frameworks that have been recognized as potential frameworks for addressing climate change. There are many definitions of ICM and the two that are presented here have hi highlighted as an interdisciplinary and intersectoral approach and a management framework that employs integrative, holistic and interactive planning processes in addressing problems in the coastal areas. So ICM is based on the principles of uh, ecosystem management and integration and coordination horizontally across sectors and vertically across the different levels of government and adaptive management, which provides flexibility to act or adapt in response to various factors, including policy and political changes and new or emerging issues. The concept and practice of ICM began in the United States in the mid 60s, and it was introduced to other areas, including Southeast Asia in the early 80s. It was recognized as a framework for sustainable development in the early 90s and over the years as a management framework for implementing various instruments, addressing priority envir environmental issues, including climate change. In the mid 90s, national efforts on ICM in East Asia increased with donor support. So this includes the series of PEMC projects supported by GF and GNDP, and with the issuance of supporting national policies and legislations in most countries in the region. So currently 40% of the coastline of the East Asian Seas region are covered by ICM and related practices, which contribute to achievement of various sustainable development goals or SDG targets at the local level. And of practical experience in the application of ICM in the East Asian region over the past 30 years has led to the development of a common framework for sustainable development of coastal areas through ICM implementation or SDA, SDCA framework for short. And this framework covers a system of governance that promotes integration and coordination of policies and functions across agencies, levels of government and sectors, several issue-specific management systems critical to achieving the overall goals of sustainable development of coastal and marine areas, including climate change adaptation, partnerships to strengthen and accelerate on the ground actions, a state of the coast reporting system for assessing and reporting progress in ICM implementation, an ICM code to guide national and local governments and recognize efforts in sustainable development of coastal areas, 
and an ICM development and implementation process that can guide the development of these various elements in the framework. So this sustainable development aspects represent one or more priorities of local governments depending on environmental conditions within their respective areas of jurisdiction. With ICM implementation, these different SD aspects are addressed in an integrated way. In the same manner, the impacts of climate change and how these could be addressed could also be considered in an integrated manner across these management programs. And the application of this framework is continuously evolving with experience and time and in response to global and national and emerging concerns. So the different elements of the SDCA framework are developed through the application of this ICM program development and implementation cycle, which has been tested and applied by PEMC for close to 30 years across varying social and political systems in the region. And the cycle is similar to a typical PDCA or Plan Do Check Act planning and management process, but expanded into six stages. And the first, or the initiating stage, focuses on the establishment of a multi-agency and cross-sectoral coordinating mechanism for ICM program development and implementation, and the initiation of baseline assessment using the SOC report or similar uh, profiling tools. And the second, or the initiating stage, focuses on identifying priorities for management actions through the SOC report, consolidation of available data and information, conduct of risk and vulnerability assessments, and stakeholder consultations to get people's perspectives on issues and risks. And in this stage, order to achieve shared vision and plans for systematic public awareness and participation and capacity development activities to support ICM implementation are also prepared. And in this stage, availability of climate change related information and conduct of climate change vulnerability assessments are important to inform the development of a coastal strategy and capacity building and public awareness engagement plans. The third, or the developing stage, focuses on developing the medium-term coastal strategy implementation plan, the coastal use zoning plan, and issue or area-specific management plans, including the institutional arrangements and financing mechanisms that will support the implementation of these plans. Similarly, the availability of information on climate change vulnerabilities and proposed adaptation measures are important for consideration in these plans, which will need to be adopted by the local governments to enable their implementation as part of their work programs and budget plans, and also of those of partners from various sectors. After some period of implementation, in accordance with the local government planning cycle, which is typically three to five years, a process of program review and evaluation will need to be undertaken in order to assess progress and accomplishments and actions in this for the next cycle. So a particular local government goes through the ICM cycle. Key governance. I'm sorry, that might be some sounds problem. So could you please um, wait until the problem is fixed? 
Thank you very much for your patience. So Ingrid, can you hear me? Hello. Oh, hello. Yeah, we can hear your voice. So maybe you can continue your presentation. Oh, okay. Sorry, Nagisa. Where did I, did you lose me? Uh, well, can you share your screen again? All right, sorry. It's okay, totally fine. Yeah, we lost you for just a few seconds, so <laughs> it was totally fine. So just go to Sorry. The slides. Yeah, maybe six. I'm back here. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, can you see it and can you hear me? All right, so yeah, so this is the ICM uh, development and implementation uh, cycle. And uh, after some period of implementation in accordance with the local government planning cycle, which is typically three to five years, a uh, process of program review and evaluation will need to be undertaken in order to assess progress and accomplishments. Program confirm priority of the plan for the site for the next cycle of implementation. So, as a particular local government goes through the ICM cycle, key governance elements for the ICM program are set in place, including local coastal strategies and implementation of plans which need to be adopted to secure political commitment and resources for their implementation. They also set in place institutional arrangements that facilitate interagency, multi-sectoral cooperation and collaboration, including a high-level program coordinating committee composed of heads or senior representatives of various agencies and key stakeholder partners, a program management framework, a office, preferably within the government's framework to coordinate day-to-day -day operation and technical or expert groups for, to provide scientific and technical support to the development and implementation of the ICM program. And guided by relevant national laws, are also developed or implemented at a level to support the great management, enforcement of the land and sea use planning, and peace education and engagement are systematically implemented at the local level of the needs of the ICM program. Appropriate uh, financing mechanisms to fund and sustain the ICM program are also developed, which will need which will include incorporation of proposed actions into the work plans and budget plans of local governments and concerned line agencies, and potentially engagement of a private, private or business sector partners, development of projects for bilateral and multilateral financing, use of revenues from uh, fees, licenses, and so on. And capacity development should also be undertaken in such a way as to develop local capacities for implementing the ICM program and partnerships with existing learning and research institutions. And local governments in ICM sites are typically supported by local universities in capacity building and various aspects of the ICM program. So this slide shows some considerations or examples in the ICM governance system that support climate change adaptation measures, so which include uh, policy strategies and plans on natural resource and coastal protection and disaster and emergency preparedness, among others, the interagency multi-sectoral coordinating mechanism, the technical and experts advisory groups that are already in place, and the human and financial resource commitments to, to support implementation of proposed actions, 
uh, legislations on ICM, land and sea use planning and enforcement of sectoral legislations. Also tools to help communities and governments build consensus on ways to minimize uh, identified risks. Also capital support for infrastructures that are resilient to the effects of climate change and disaster preparedness activities, including simulations, demonstrations, and drills, and so on. Now, the governance system that promotes integration, collaboration, and partnerships and promotes science and policy interface should also support the integrated development and implementation of the sustainable development aspects or management programs in accordance with the priorities of the local government and stakeholders. And as I mentioned earlier, results and uh, recommendations from vulnerability assessments are important to enable the incorporation of climate change adaptation measures spread on sustainable development aspect. Various ICM sites have developed programs and implemented measures in accordance with their priorities and capacities. So include addressing national and man-made hazards, including floods and oil spills, and habitat protection and restoration activities, including establishing MPA and MPA networks within the broader ICM system, uh, water conservation and use measures, various measures to reduce pollution and manage waste, including those that engage communities, and various measures for sustaining fisheries and developing alternative livelihoods. So this slide shows some examples of measures across the sustainable development aspects that support climate change adaptation, uh, which we will not uh, go through one by one, but include, for example, use of soft engineering uh, approaches, like mangrove reforestation to improve coastal protection, various coastal habitat restoration activities, watershed management, groundwater management, alternative livelihood programs, and waste reduction, segregation, reuse, and recovery activities. So the uh, SDCA framework uh, also includes a uh, state of the coast uh, reporting system that developed also based on the elements of the framework that assess the progress of local governance in ICM implementation. And the framework also includes this ICM code, which is also a lot of work that um, can help uh, assess and recognize the progress across uh, ICM sites in terms of for um, ICM implementation. So we have seen, and I, I hope this is clear from this presentation, that uh, ICM has evolved into a comprehensive system for sustainable management and use of coastal and marine areas, uh, such that it provides uh, local and national governments and key stakeholders and partners a systematic approach to planning, developing, implementing, monitoring, and evaluating programs that address local issues and priorities in an integrated manner including those related to climate change. And uh, for ICM and other coastal management programs that have developed, uh, focusing on selected priority issues and have yet to consider aspects of climate change adaptation, uh, this can be incorporated by going through their next ICM planning and implementation cycle and including a climate lens from the baseline setting, conduct of risk and vulnerability assessments, development of strategic plans, uh, zoning plans, and implementation plans that uh, target increasing the ecosystem and population's resilience to impacts of natural and man-made hazards, including climate change and so on. So this is just to emphasize that ICM programs can be further strengthened to support climate change adaptation through deliberate incorporation of climate change considerations into the ICM development and implementation process using appropriate tools and instilling adaptation thinking into various facets of management and the public consciousness. So thus far, implementation of ICM, although in varying uh, levels of maturity, covers 40% of the coastline of the East Asian region and some station sites in the RRN and Forces region as well. 
So then in the EAS and EDS regions, provide an opportunity for ICN implementation to contribute toward achievement of climate change adaptation commitments and targets of countries in these regions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ingrid. You highlighted how the ICM has evolved to help communities community climate change adaptation uh, with some concrete example. So ICM is widely known effective tool to manage coastal zone, but to um, help us to reevaluate re the ICM framework in the adaptation context. Thank you very much. Now we would like to learn a little bit more about ICM cases. So let me invite Ms. Nisa Korn Wivekwin. Nisa Korn is the ICM program coordinator at Sasuk Municipal Office in Chambri, Thailand. She will be sharing the case of adaptation practice with ICM uh, from local perspective. Over to you, Nisa Korn. Good morning, everyone. Let, let me share screen to my presentation. Excuse me. This is all right. Um, for me, I will uh, share for everybody in terms of local government practice. Like uh, Ingrid had, if you for more information about the ICM project, um, Chamboli is the province in Thailand. Um, that we starting to be the ICM site, demonstration site. And then now we uh, rapid transform from the agriculture to industrial economic is caused by uh, to the habitat loss, the pollution and so many youth conflict. So we set the test team uh, for this assessment for the integrated system and then the coastal strategy, also the public awareness. Um, because uh, at that time, uh, we are do the individual organization, we not the uh, integrated to work together. Uh, so many information uh, we, we choose to co uh, collaborate. The many environmental issue gathering from that team. The coastal strategy that we set the vision and our mission to considering priority concern um, identified from the assessment and stakeholder consultation. I want to back for Chamboli province, we start with the five local government and then we try to do together within five local government um, activity in the coastal strategy implementation plan for art we uh, need to strengthening the governance mechanism for coastal and environmental management. Also, the implementation of um, management program related to um, 
five aspect. Yeah. Uh, the governor for Shibori province uh, to be the, the chairman for our committee or test team. Mm. That uh, five local government at the initiate, now we uh, scale up in terms of the geographical uh, to cover um, the coastline, province coastline is including 26 local government. And then we uh, collaborate to another plan local government in inland also. That's uh, over our province. Um, we address new priorities on concern after the year 2010. Um, coastal erosion climate change is including in our um, concern. Um, we also updating in accordance with new law. Now it's law about the marine and coastal resource management. Um, for all of local government, we have to set the one vision together uh, as healthy city. The activity also related to uh, habitat protection, restoration, and management, food security and alternative livelihood development, pollution reduction and waste management, um, hazard prevention and um, management, also the education, mobilization, and capacity building. We, always, we want to share you some activity for our city, uh, our province. Yeah, just quick. That uh, related to the lesson from previous presentation uh, of the speaker in the first session also. That the uh, action to pollution reduction and waste management. that the hazard prevention and management. Because um, our city, we are the oil tanker and seaport zone. The mobilization and capacity building for all sector to involve especially the community-based environmental monitoring. The financing mechanism, mobilization from all resource uh, is under the law and also the by um, CSR program from, from each. Um, we transform the ICM from project base uh, into a local government program right now. The designing marine conservation activity to um, decrease vulnerability of Shumri to climate change impact also our activity. Um, for Sansu, Municipality is my my city. Um, we 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 set the coastal erosion list management as a um, our priority seriously impact to to hit our tourism area. Um, 
like uh, so many city they do the vulnerability assessment we also set this uh, by the CWAT as a tool um, consultation with the professional literature uh, and face-to-face -face assignment, we also do this. This is what the example I show you quickly. Um, as the result, like a uh, scientific data show highly uh, vulnerability to our coastal erosion um, and we consult with the relevant sector within my city and in in our country to provide the action for respond this matter uh, also the the coastal strategy we still keep on the um, information, mitigation, and protect, and uh, uh, preserve and conserve and develop. It's our coastal strategy to to uh, action. Um, our action. Uh, we we want to increase adaptive capacity score that the type of score from the vulnerability assessment. Uh, but more important, we try to build a low carbon society that uh, seem to uh, indicated implementation by the city uh, as the call to collaboration with other agency and partner. Um, for the view to low carbon society, we also ongoing to do this activity that I, I have to present in my previous slide. Uh, that become uh, confirming the ICM concept and uh, ongoing the ICM program that like Ingrid had to uh, present how to ICM program works. Just for the increasing uh, adaptive capacity score, um, we cannot do anything so much, um, but we, we try to like a uh, modify any structure that causing obstruction that the result from our assessment. Uh, I want to um, conclude about the uh, building a low carbon society is very important. That um, ICM program is provide a framework for this activity is very good to collaboration with another sector. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Nisa Korn, for sharing this successful case study of incorporating ICM into local practice for creating a resilience communities. You also provided good implication from the perspective of capacity building and financing. Thank you very much. I would like to hand over the floor to Dr. Brian Johnson, the Senior Researcher and Deputy Director of Adaptation and Water Area at the um, IGES, Institute for Global Environmental Strategy. He is a geoscience specialist who has extensive experience of research projects in Southeast Asia related to adaptation. So, Brian, you have the floor now. Hey, thank you, Nagisa, and thank you, everyone, for uh, sticking around. I have the challenge of being the last presenter, so I hope you're all alert, or at least awake, and uh, have some more space in your brain for more information. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to present about some participatory approaches and geospatial modeling techniques that we are using in one project to address the coastal resilience. Uh, so this is a project going on in the Philippines, and we are working with the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. So I see many participants from Philippines. I don't know if anyone's a UPLB student or UPLB alumni, but hello. Uh, so the project is called the Participatory Coastal Land Use Management Project, PCLM. Uh, and the objective of this project is to help local government units uh, become more resilient to climate change and its impacts. Um, so we're using participatory approaches uh, and we're using some free uh, modeling and uh, yeah, free geospatial modeling software. Um, so we're providing different types of support to local governments through this project, like uh, conducting the land use change and climate change impact assessments. And then we're helping the local governments identify some priority climate change adaptation measures based on these impact assessments. And then we're also providing some assistance to help uh, local governments update or improve their local plans or policies. And then uh, also to help them kind of apply for adaptation funds like uh, international funds like Green Climate Fund or in the Philippines, there's one called the People's Survival Fund. So these are funds for implementing some adaptation related activities. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll just go over this approach. So there's uh, four main steps. So the first step is the scenario development. So we are using uh, some uh, participatory mappings similar to other presenters. Uh, we are basically printing out the uh, poster size like a land use map of the current land use and then asking local governments to show uh, where they're planning different types of land use conversion, like where they're planning to um, uh, build a new urban area or uh, where they're planning to restore some mangroves or something like this. And then we use this as some scenario for the future. Uh, we're also looking at the future climate scenarios, so by downscaling the uh, climate model data. Uh, and then, so once we have these different scenarios, we are using free uh, spatial modeling tools um, in free GIS software to try to assess these uh, impacts. So we're using free software because at the end of the project, we train the local governments and also like the local students, uh, university students. So how to conduct this approach so they can keep going with it in, in the future because right, our project is limited a few years. Uh, so, um, sorry, can you go back? Okay, so after that, uh, then we present the results of these impact assessments to local governments. Um, either, yeah, if we can go there, that's great. If not, we are using Zoom now, uh, like everyone else. So uh, with them, we try to identify some countermeasures based on these, you know, these, uh, future impacts. And then finally, we uh, tried to get them to uh, adopt these priority countermeasures in their uh, updated land use plans or climate change action plans. So in, in the Philippines, every local government is preparing uh, comprehensive land use plans and also like lo local climate change action plans, I think every five years or so. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for this study, we are working mainly in Oriental Mindoro. Uh, it's on Mindoro Island, so it's uh, southwest of the Metro Manila area, a few hours by ferry. And it's exposed to yeah, many of the coastal hazards I think that everyone has uh, been talking about already. So storm surge, uh, sea level rise, uh, coastal erosion, and groundwater salinization. Okay, next slide, please. So when we first started this project, we uh, did a survey with local governments to identify what their uh, climate change risks were, what their perceived climate change risks. So this is kind of the, the key um, you know, hazards they were concerned about. So groundwater salinization and sea level rise, a storm surge and then coastal sedimentation. So we can see uh, even in this one site, there's quite a lot of uh, variability by local governments. So some local governments are facing like the issue of the uh, coastal sedimentation, others have no kind of problem with it. So we have to kind of keep this in mind whenever we're doing our modeling and uh, developing these uh, policies. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is just showing uh, what we are doing with participatory mapping. So uh, basically the local government officers are uh, drawing on the maps where they're planning some land use conversions and then they're adding some more details about it so we can uh, understand it. And then we digitize this into GIS. So we're using the QGIS as one uh, free software. Okay, so next slide, please. Uh, so this is just some of the information we can get from this participatory mapping. So in this study site, we are able to estimate, okay, what are the future changes uh, in the land use based on this kind of business as usual, or what this, uh, you know, the current plans. So we can see like in this study area, there's a built up area change uh, increase by about 4%, 3.5%, and then there's uh, some reduction in the fish ponds. 
and actually there's an increase in mangrove uh, planned in the future. So mainly it's converting these uh, abandoned or unproductive fish ponds back to mangrove habitat. So this is kind of a encouraging finding. Next slide, please. Okay, so we're now we're showing what are the different tools we're using. So uh, for coastal vulnerability impact assessment, we're using one model called the INVEST coastal vulnerability model. So INVEST is one free software. It's used to assess ecosystem services. So different types of ecosystem services are like a, you can estimate the benefits provided by the natural ecosystems, basically. Uh, so I think uh, if, if you can get this presentation later, you can check these links for the software. Uh, one, we're doing another one for sea level rise. This is the sea level affecting marshes model, SLAM model. And then finally for this groundwater salinization or uh, we're using the water evaluation and planning tool or WEEP tool. Okay, this is free for uh, developing countries. So if you're not from developing country, you need to pay, I think a small fee, but uh, if you're in developing country, you can get it for free. The next slide, please. Okay, next one. Okay, so I'll just talk a little bit about INVEST. Uh, so this, this model uh, lets you see how modifications of the biological or physical environment uh, can affect the vulnerability of the coastal areas to different uh, hazards like uh, storm-induced erosion and flooding. So this model is calculating an exposure index. So it's kind of a, it's a range from like one to five. So five means very high coastal exposure to these hazards. One means very low. And it's based on uh, seven different parameters. So like the relief of the land or the elevation of the land, uh, the presence or absence of different types of habitats like uh, mangroves or seagrass, because these kind of ecosystems are protecting the coastlines, right? Um, then it's also considering uh, wind exposure. So the local kind of wind speeds and then wave exposure, uh, and then the storm surge uh, potential and also the, the land uh, geomorphology. And then if we're considering climate change, then it's also, uh, you can take into account sea level changes. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so in this project, uh, we're showing a kind of extreme scenario besides this uh, business as usual scenario. So we want to help the local stakeholders understand the vulnerability of the coastline with all of the habitats that are there, there now. And then, okay, what's the vulnerability without these habitats? Just so we can and demonstrate you know, why these habitats are so important. And then uh, another uh, scenario is considering only the estuarine habitats or the terrestrial habitats. Okay, so I think we'll show just the all habitats uh, scenario next. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see this is the output of the model. You get the, um, okay, you get a value from one to five uh, for each segment of the coastline. Here we're looking at 100 meter uh, you know, intervals. So we are showing like in this area, there's one large city called Kalapan City. So uh, now it's mostly green the, along the coast. Okay, it's, this is the Northeast part of the map. Uh, but if these coastal habitats are converted to like urban areas or agricultural areas, you can see it changes to red or orange. So much higher uh, coastal exposure to these, these hazards. So it's very important for them to protect these ecosystems. Next slide, please. Okay, next I'll just present about the SLAM model. Uh, so before we do any kind of impact assessment, we are looking at the local sea level rise uh, rates. Actually, we don't have the measurements from land, uh, so we can't uh, consider the, the land movement up or down, uh, but we have some satellite measurements from the, the sea height. Okay, so this is from the Aviso uh, satellite. Um, it's one website there. They're kind of compiling different satellite altimetry measurements. Uh, so we can get data for each half degree latitude longitude. So this is off the coast. We can see uh, from 1992 to 2010, uh, there was a sea level rise uh, rate of 7.2 millimeters per year. So we can use this to make the future projections. Next slide, please. Okay, so this SLAM model has a relatively simple interface. Uh, we have to prepare some data beforehand in the QGIS. Um, so it, it's considering these main processes that are linked with sea level rise. So the coastal inundation, erosion, uh, soil accretion, soil saturation, and overwash. Uh, and there's different inputs like a land cover map. So if we want to look at a current, maybe future, also a land cover map, uh, elevation map, a slope map, and then other types of uh, field data like a, a local sea level rise rate or coastal erosion or accretion rates in the mangrove habitats. So we want to see like uh, mainly is the 
soil building up in mangrove habitats faster than sea level rise. So this is going to have some uh, impact on the, the inland areas. So are these uh, mangroves able to protect the inland like uh, urban areas or agricultural areas in the future uh, despite sea level rise? So we can look at different sea level rise scenarios based on the IPCC uh, projections or we can just uh, determine it uh, based on like one meter or two meter by a certain a year or we can base it on the historical data. Uh, so can you go to the next slide, please? So here we presented the, to local governments kind of concerning a little bit higher than the historical sea level rise rate because uh, it's projected that sea level rise is going to increase in the future. Uh, the rates are going to increase in the future. So we we're showing them kind of conservative estimate. But even with this, we can see by 2050, there's uh, several areas that uh, will be uh, flooded in this study site, either uh, regularly flooded or permanently flooded. Uh, so this is, uh, this is kind of showing, okay, on the left, you have the, the land cover map, the current land cover map, and then the right, you have the map showing like some urban areas. It looks like they're converted to a transitional salt, salt marsh or rev regularly flooded marsh. So I, I think they're not really going to become marshes, but uh, whatever is there will be either permanently flooded or kind of uh, regularly flooded in the future without any kind of protection. Okay, next slide, please. And then finally, we are doing a groundwater quality assessment. So first, uh, we work with local governments and we ask them to go collect some uh, well samples, some water samples. And then uh, we have the workshop. This is, I think, uh, just before COVID. Uh, so we had the workshop and then we uh, tested these water samples uh, during the workshops. And then we shared this information with the local governments. So we're looking at mainly uh, electrical conductivity and then total dissolved solids and chloride in temperature also. Next slide, please. Okay, so then we are kind of plotting this information to show uh, which of the well samples are having the, you know, the, the big problem. So high EC and high uh, CL values indicate that the groundwater has already become, uh, it already has very high salinity. So it's, uh, it can be hazardous to health if you consume it over long periods of time. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and then we are plotting this information using the GIS software like QGIS so that the, the local governments can see which specific areas are having the, the, the major problems. Okay, and we can also say, uh, if we overlay it onto a soil map, we can see like sandy or uh, areas with sandy loam soil, they're specifically, you know, uh, particularly vulnerable to this uh, salinization. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so I just want to explain a little about this uh, wheat model. So it can, uh, take into account uh, yeah, many of these different uh, uh, land cover parameters and also this, uh, this field data. Uh, it has a GIS-based uh, uh, graphical drop and drop interface, so you don't need to know programming. And you can uh, incorporate different scenarios uh, in this model. Okay, next slide, please. So this is just showing some of the outputs you can get. So if you have a specific site of interest, so we, we looked at the site that's having the the major problems right now, and we uh, ran some scenarios. So uh, this is considering the future climate change and also future land use change, and then the population growth in the future. Uh, so we want to show that what are the impacts of each of these different changes on the, the water quality. So here we're looking at chloride. So we can see uh, this uh, blue bar, this is the first bar for each of these two wells. So there's a G1 and G2 are two different wells. Uh, we can see now the value is around for the G1, for example, is around 20, uh, 2200. But if we consider climate change, uh, then it goes up to this orange bar. Uh, sorry, that's population increase. And then if we consider um, uh, these other different parameters, so like uh, climate change and then uh, land use change, then we can see it keeps increasing. So we can calculate uh, the contribution of each factor to this water quality degradation. Uh, and then try to get the local governments to uh, make some countermeasures to, to reduce these uh, you know, the impacts of these changes. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is just an example of some countermeasures that were identified. So after we present these uh, impact assessments, then local governments decided, okay, they want to strengthen the management system of the existing um, marine protected areas in one um, area, Calipan City, uh, to reduce these future hazards. And also uh, they want to develop some training materials or educational materials for the local communities. Uh, so that they can understand the importance of mangroves and other coastal habitats for 
uh, climate change adaptation. And so they can better kind of take care of these ecosystems. And also they want to conduct some uh, mangrove tree planting activities. Okay, I'll skip the rest because I think we are running out of time. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is just, uh, now I want to share one guidebook we created. Uh, so we made one uh, kind of guidebook with tutorials for each of these different uh, models and uh, participatory methods. So uh, it's available at this link here. So if you're interested uh, in this approach, PCLM, then uh, please feel free to uh, yeah, use this uh, guidebook. Okay, uh, thank you very much and happy to take your questions later. Thanks, Brian. I understand PCLM is such a great example of a tool that bridges the science-based assessment and land use planning process at community level. Thank you very much. Through the presentation series, we've heard about the powerful and effective tool that help community identify priority adaptation measures. To deep dive into the key point raised in the presentation, we would like to move on to the panel discussion which will be moderated by Dr. Prabhakar Sivapram, a research manager and a senior research um, fellow at the Adaptation and Water Area of IGES. Prabhakar, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Nagita, for this. And uh, hello, everyone. My name is Prabhakar. So for the next 20 minutes, uh, we will engage our panel members beyond what they said so far. And uh, hopefully also able to engage you as well. Um, so far, we have not received many questions, so I encourage you all to type in questions in the question and answer section of the Zoom. As we go ahead, I will try to pose them to our panel members. So uh, before we, I come back to the panel uh, questions posed by the participants, we have identified a set of questions so that you know we can spend some time before our uh, participants can you know, break the ice and start thinking of posing questions. So the first question that appears in the list is, what is the importance of the scientific information and tools um, to facilitate the decision-making at the local level? So we already had at least two presentations from our uh, panel members. Uh, one is on the species vulnerability, the other one is you know, integrated coastal management by uh, Brian Johnson, uh, where they used uh, several uh, technical tools. So, um, and uh, EC ICF uh, as a framework has also been uh, presented. So this question covers all the speakers. So I welcome anybody. Um, how much are we uh, to rely I mean, uh, to all of our uh, panel members? How much are we to rely on scientific information and tools before we take any decisions for coastal zone management, for climate change adaptation? Uh, do we really need to wait for them? Or should we go ahead with whatever the information do we have. So um, I welcome any panel member. Uh, you can raise the question, um, I mean, your hand, or otherwise you can straight away answer. Uh, any panel member? Should we wait sure. for this? Yeah, well, I'm yeah. happy to answer that if, if nobody else or let someone else jump in after me. But yes. I, I think it's a balance and I think it's very important to not wait. I think that the last part of that question was really important. I think that we we have a lot of scientific information and yeah. what we've seen today presented is how that very quickly with that scientific information, we can deliver some really important results that can inform local actions. So I think it is important to base the decisions about actions on the science. However, yes. I don't think we need to wait is really important. And so sort of touching on one of the questions I've noticed in the chat that was uh, directed towards me is that, you know, the sorts of adaptations, you know, the science, what it can tell us is that while there are a lot of very general and broad adaptations that can support coastal systems, habitat species, and all of those go towards I guess, building climate resilience so that they can uh, get better with future climate change. What the science gives us or what, the, you know, these tools that we've, we've fed the science in to give us some detailed results gives us is and the ability to make sure we're actually targeting the the actions that make the greatest difference so whether that's specific species specific habitats um, and actions that promote um, the health or the resilience if you like of those species and habitats so for example you know i think we've heard a lot 
and I certainly mentioned in my presentation about um, basic fishery or, you know, fisheries being overfished in many cases and obviously primary fisheries management is an important response to build the resilience of fisheries. But through the, the assessment, we, we were able to identify specifically which species were most vulnerable to climate and what they were vulnerable to so that your responses can be a bit more nuanced, if you like. So it's not just about primary fisheries management. It's about actually promoting, protecting, sorry, the habitats that those species breed in perhaps, or they use as nursery grounds. It's about uh, reducing incidental catch of juveniles in some cases. So we can be a little bit more specific with the local actions and, and also I think really help take communities through a journey so that it doesn't feel like we've got these really broad adaptations, but that we're targeting them to the most important resources and to the most uh, important drivers of vulnerability. Fantastic, Dr. Johansson. Um, thanks very much for touching the question that I raised earlier as well. Um, so just to understand what you said, uh, the communities will benefit more from specific adaptation actions targeting specific species compared to general fisheries well-being, you mean to say that? Well, as well as, I mean, I don't think we would ever ignore primary fisheries management, but when we're talking about um, communities that probably can't do everything, and in many cases, uh, primary fisheries management isn't within their realm to influence necessarily, it comes uh, from above. So they can still, though, have a role in, in, in other actions that promote the climate resilience of key species and key habitats and specifically knowing which species to focus on which habitats and what will protect them um, because we understand what's driving their vulnerability. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. And do we have any other uh, responses from panel members? Okay, so... Yes, Dr. Uh, Rabakar, maybe yeah. I can add to Yes, that. Ingrid. Yes, Dr. Ingrid. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as uh, mentioned by Dr. Johanna, uh, scientific mm -hmm. information and tools are necessary. Okay, and uh, actually, this can uh, these are necessary in order to help identify priorities for management uh, interventions. Uh, also, combined, of course, with uh, like um, knowing lo uh, the local people's uh, perspectives on the risks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, scientific uh, information uh, also would need to be presented in forms that would be understandable to yeah. uh, various uh, people, including policy makers, decision makers, the postal managers, to enable them to take necessary uh, actions for you know designing uh, measures to address the identified uh, risks. So I, I think um, communicating risks is very important and this would need support, you know, of course, not just from the natural scientists, but also from um, social scientists as well and you know, experts on uh, communications. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you so much. The second question is, um, this is a very general question often asked to anybody who talks about adaptation. Uh, do we need to spray and take specific adaptation actions or um, can they be integrated into general developmental policies and plans? So when it comes to the coastal zone and the coastal issue, how much do you see the potential to integrate the adaptation into general development? Um, do you see that it is the area where we need a very specific adaptation action? Um, or you know, just like anywhere else, the um, coastal adaptation actions can be integrated into local development in the coastal zones or at the national level because many ocean-related adaptation actions goes beyond the local capacity. So um, this question, uh, I welcome anybody, I think uh, Dr. Ingrid or um, Dr. Iqbal or Dr. Matthew, any, any one of you, if you are willing to answer this question. So maybe I can try to, <laughs> try to yeah, uh, address that. So, um, okay, so we prepared climate change adaptation plans, but uh, these will remain as plans. Uh, if these are not uh, adopted, then incorporated into the development of remits. But um, in order to enable the addressing the real uh, priorities uh, in the area and reflecting uh, actions that can be uh, realistically uh, implemented, 
considering the capacities and resources also available in, in the area. And uh, engaging local policymakers and decision makers in the consultation process and development of these plans is important in order to ensure that you know, we, we get their perspectives, we get their inputs, and we develop their ownership and uh, commitment for adopting and uh, implementing these plans. Fantastic, thank you so much. So, uh, you know, it comes down to the point of capacity building. Uh, we often, as outsiders, quote and unquote, uh, we tend to think uh, uh, straight from the beginning that, you know, local communities, local institutions, they don't have capacity. But often we underestimate their existing capacities as well before we start implementing our project, thanks to this adaptation capacity assessment framework that also considers this local adaptive capacity into consideration. Um, so this question relates to all your work that you have presented so far. To what extent have you been able to use local capacity? Um, and what is the real capacity issue there? I mean, uh, after you start using the local capacity, do you still have some capacity gaps? Do you think so? And is it uh, practical to think that those capacities can be you know, addressed within the time frame of a project, typically three years, five years? So maybe I will start from uh, Dr. John Johnson. Uh, so I'm going to go to each individual panel members because this question is related to all of you. Yeah. Sure, thank you. So yes, adaptive capacity is obviously, like you're saying, a critical part of being able to uh, respond to climate change. And obviously I showed the framework we used incorporated adaptive capacity and that included both ecological and social adaptive capacity so yes. using you know expert um, judgment and local knowledge we were able to consider things like the capacity of communities or management to adapt or the ability to target uh, you know to conduct your business whether it's tourism or get your food from alternative sources so yes it's critically important and something that you would have heard uh, Iqbal present on also is now that we're at this case study phase where we're working with local communities to develop an action plan. There's a lot of discussion about the capacity of communities to implement actions. And you would have seen those great tables that Iqbal put up that considered, you know, cost and what resources, skills or knowledge might be needed. I mean, all of that speaks to the capacity of communities to adapt or implement actions. And that will be, that's obviously part of the whole process of developing a community action plan. So Yes, it's critically important and it needs to be considered, I think, at all stages and with, you know, at the regional as well as the local. And um, what we found with species or habitats that were highly vulnerable to climate change, quite often the driver was a lack of adaptive capacity. I mean, we have a lot more detail about what specifically, but that is definitely one of those drivers of vulnerability. Great. Uh, so before we go to... Um the next panel member, I welcome all the participants to type their questions, uh, if they have any, to our panel members. So, uh, Iqbal, do you have any response in terms of, you know, how best can we use the local capacities uh, before we, you know, judging that, you know, we need to build the capacity of the local communities? Yes, uh, so, okay. Uh, so, uh, during the immersion, we, talk a lot with the community what they are uh, capable to or if they are capable just to assess uh, how the um, local action uh, uh, will be uh, like I said in my presentation we filter the uh, local action by two metrics the uh, locally accepted and the effectiveness also the cost and the uh, capacity so they're the one who uh, assess their own local action because they're the one who's gonna implement it. So we want that the local action come from them and uh, implement by them and also monitored by them. So uh, in, um, uh, having them participate um, on the formulation of the local action is uh, important so that the sustainability of the local action will be uh, last longer. 
Great, great. Thank you so much. We have five minutes to go. So uh, the last question is, uh, I mean, the last uh, predetermined question is what kind of platforms and tools are available for patient support? I think many of your presentations you have already listed, but if you have anything to say, um, for example, the Japan work presented by Dr. Bian, a lot of tools and methodologies, um, building upon them, you know, those can be used by local stakeholders. You may want to say something about that. Any tools and the methodologies and platforms uh, to support the knowledge and information sharing or for local decision making uh, that, that, yeah, that you haven't put in your presentations, but you want to say something about it. Okay, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, maybe I could uh, start. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, currently, uh, with regard to this uh, knowledge sharing platforms or uh, forums or opportunities, uh, PEMC has an existing network of local governments that are implementing a IICM program. So they get together every year to share experiences and good practices you know, yeah. in addressing various issues, so including climate change. And uh, they're also free to uh, interact or exchange uh, information uh, among them, you know, in between the forums. And uh, PEMC also has a PEMC network of learning centers, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, is composed of um, uh, like uh, academic and research uh, institutions that are, you know, providing technical and capacity building support to local and uh, national uh, governments in addressing various uh, issues. So these are, you know, um, like a good uh, potential forums for knowledge sharing, also uh, capacity uh, building, and, you know, th that, um, yeah, PEMC has been um, coordinating. And uh, currently we are... Um, preparing for a program to you know, bring this up. PNLG or the Local Government Network and the PNLC or the Le uh, Network of Learning Centers you know, into a, a forum to jointly uh, uh, understand key issues in the local governments that may need support from you know, scientific and uh, technical uh, aspects that may also be um, provided or uh, supported by uh, the network of learning centers. And yeah. uh, PEMC also has the an online platform, which we call the Seas of East Asia Knowledge Bank or CKB, that uh, contains uh, information on, on good practices you know, that are, uh, that, that uh, have been, uh, documented from the various areas that can be shared for uh, replication uh, in other local governments. So it also has a reporting uh, system for uh, that can share local governments' um, progress in addressing uh, various uh, SDG uh, goals and targets in their specific areas, and uh, also uh, include, including targets on climate change. Yeah, thank you, Ingrid. I hope our you know, um, participants they will be able to access the PMC website and uh, refer to all the tools that you, uh, you know, talked about. Well, we have a uh, time for one question, and that goes to the, the participant. This question is to Dr. Johansson. Uh, the, the question is about, you know, in your presentation and the work, you focus more on macro species. What about microorganisms that respond to climate change much faster? So how are they going to help us in our addressing climate change? Um, so do you have any response, Dr. Johansson? Uh, thank you. Uh, the, the audio was a bit difficult to hear, but I think I'm just reading the question in the Q&A, yes. so that's fine. Thank you. Uh, look, I mean, in the past, so, so you, know, you know, we've used this sort of assessment approach, and it, and it is a rapid, if you like, desktop, largely, um, assessment approach and we've used it in the past on the Great Barrier Reef in parts of the Pacific um, on northern Australia and Torres Strait and on occasions we've uh, also assessed microorganisms and how they um, are vulnerable to climate change. I think the point that we found in the past uh, is first of all 
that in terms of adaptations that communities might be able to do or that might be able to happen on a strategic regional level, there's really, um, you know, microorganisms are not something people will focus on generally and the activities you would take potentially to promote healthy microorganisms communities um, would be taken anyway in addressing things like land-based runoff or those sorts of things. So um, I think, you know, it's something that we have included in the past but hasn't had a direct application to local adaptations or strategic adaptations. And I think, you know, we already know that microorganisms are vulnerable to changing climate uh, yeah. and they underpin the system, there's no doubt. But this is meant to be a rapid uh, process that really informs local actions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that's the time we have for the group discussion or uh, for the open discussion. And um, so just to conclude, what I understood from this discussion is, of course, the scientific tools are important, but we should not wait for them. Uh, we should go ahead with the solution that we have and we can implement with the information we have. But we should always keep our eyes and ears open for the new information that the science is providing and constantly change our approach. And of course, the second one is, as we have seen many presenters, they talked about integrated solutions. But how do we make them simple, uh, workable for the local stakeholders? That's one question that we should work upon uh, as we go ahead. So thank you so much. And I hand over to our uh, yeah, organizers. Thank you. Thank you so much, the moderator and the speaker uh, for the productive discussion. Um, in the panel discussion, we share the, um, that the science-based tool can help community to take a specific adaptation action, which is also important for community communicating risks with um, communi um, communities. Participatory approach are also useful to understand the local adaptive capacity, which is also the key element of the whole process of development and implementation of adaptation action. Thank you very much um, for all the speaker. Uh, so I would like to request Dr. Handiko Adisanko, uh, the regional project manager of at C2 to kindly provide a closing remark over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Nagisa. Thanks, Dr. Abakar, for your questions. Uh, distinguished uh, speakers, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and uh, friends, uh, I'm uh, very uh, honored and delighted uh, to deliver uh, the closing remarks of uh, the Zoom uh, webinar on the climate change adaptation for our coastal communities, learning from East Asia and Arafura and uh, Timor. Agents. So uh, I would like to uh, begin uh, the closing remark by uh, quoting, uh, quoting uh, the IPCC uh, 2021 uh, report. Yeah, that mentions uh, recent uh, changes in the climate uh, are widespread, rapid, and intensifying, and unprecedented uh, in uh, thousands of years. And this is evidence in East Asian seas and Arafura and Timor seas regions, as uh, presented uh, earlier. From uh, climate projections uh, presented by Dr. Johanna, we can see that in these uh, two regions, oceans are getting warmer and uh, more acidic, and sea level rise is accelerating, while increasing threat from extreme weather, such as storms, heavy rainfalls, drought and heat wave are being observed in a coastal community. Climate change is indeed real and around us. There is no way to negate that. The cross-cutting uh, nature of climate change has made uh, it uh, the biggest challenges of our time. Thus, we cannot just sit uh, idly by. To respond to uh, this challenge, uh, today we have heard a number of active efforts being undertaken 
in the East and ETS regions to help uh, make uh, coastal communities more resilient and adaptive to climate change. Like example sound from uh, Wesley Village, yeah, from our colleagues uh, Iqbal uh, from Rotendau District, East Nusa Tenggara, Indonesia, and then from uh, Sainsuk, Chonburi Province, Thailand, and then also from Oriental Mindoro, uh, Philippines. Several tools or approach like the HC2 project guidance for decision makers, PMC ICM approach, and also IGES uh, novel uh, PCLM yeah, have been shared and discussed throughout uh, this college. All of them have the same takeaways. Firstly, it is uh, crucial to translate the uh, scientific findings to a language understood by the communities and use uh, to build uh, relevant adaptation strategies. And secondly, uh, it is uh, advisable that the process uh, be carried out as uh, participatory as possible to build uh, the ownership of the communities. And thirdly, it is equally important to ensure uh, communities have the requisite uh, knowledge and capacity to carry out uh, the strategies. Lastly, uh, climate lens uh, definitely needs uh, to be incorporated into economic and development plans, policy, and actions. Uh, these tools and approach uh, have been tested at some pilot sites. And now it is a matter of uh, replicating the tools and approach to scaling up the best practices and lesson learned. To do so, collaboration and partnership between local government, research institutions, donor agencies, and local communities are key. We cannot do this alone. Uh, we hope uh, that uh, the discussion initiated uh, by this collab can ignite further conversation and collaboration or partnership on responding to climate change in these regions. We also hope that experiences, approaches, and tools shared today may contribute to further enriching knowledge and discussions leading up to the UNFCCC Conference of Parties in November next month. I noted uh, there are about uh, 142 participants yeah, uh, coming from Indonesia, US, Fiji, Cambodia, Japan, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and uh, Timor Leste. Thank you very much uh, to all speakers yeah, uh, who have shared their knowledge and experiences and the organizing committee from IGES, PMC, and uh, my colleague, uh, the institute team for the successful organization and conduct of this college. I hope uh, this will not be the end of our collaborations. Yeah? I would like uh, also to thank our participants and hopefully uh, you have learned something from this session. Finally, I would like to close this collab uh, by quoting IPCC again, that the climate uh, we experience uh, in the future depend on our decision now. So again, that the climate uh, we experience in the future depends on our decision now. I hope this event can propel us to build more climate resilience of coastal communities in the East Asian Seas and Arafura and Timor Seas region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Handiko. Um, it was a great remark. Um, so I would like to quickly recap the session. The speaker provided interesting climate change adaptation initiative with path breaking tools to assess climate risks and identify priority adaptation needs. We have a lot of inspiration on how the community and decision maker are informed and empowered to build resilience using a local knowledge. So with great gratitude, I would like to conclude this session. We thank again all of you for your great um, participation. Stay safe and have a nice day. Goodbye.
The Arafura uh, and Timor uh, Seas region, or ATS, is unique in terms of its ecology, geography, and socio-political structure. It is rich in resources and home to a vast array of natural wonders. Shared by Australia, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and Timor-Leste, this fertile corridor of tropical water connects the Pacific and Indian Oceans. This area provides the peoples of many nations with essential resources, while also stocking the world's oceans with biodiversity. Unfortunately, overfishing, marine and land-based pollution, loss of habitat, and the impacts of climate change create a major threat to most marine life in the region. This underlines the urgent need for a collective regional action and transboundary management of economically important fish species, critical habitats, and marine megafauna. Therefore, in 2006, the ATS Expert Forum developed and submitted a bid to the Global Environment Facility, which came to be known as the Arafura and Timor Seas Ecosystem Action Program, or ATC. The initial phase was officially launched in 2010 and created a regional collaboration tasked with finding sustainable solutions for problems affecting coastal and marine resources in the region. In 2019, the second phase of at Sea, known as at Sea 2 has been adapted to take the collaboration and coordination in the ATS region a step further through the endorsement and implementation of a 10-year vision for the ATS, known as the Strategic Action Program. It is made up of three main components. The first component focuses on strengthening the regional and national collaboration mechanism and establishing a stakeholder partnership forum to facilitate implementation of priority actions and better participatory processes. The second component focuses on developing an ecosystem approach to the fisheries management plan, strengthening the implementation of regional plan of action to combat IUU fishing, assessing marine and land-based pollution, establishing and supporting the management of marine protected areas, and developing a regional plan to enhance marine turtle protection. And the third component focuses on improving the monitoring of the ATS region and sharing knowledge gained from the project. Through the three components, at C2 aims to achieve its main objectives in the ATS to foster sustainable development in the region by improving the quality of life of its inhabitants through restoration, conservation, and sustainable management of marine coastal ecosystems for a better life.